Welcome to Conversations with Barbara. I'm Barbara Candelopoulos, and with me today is Donna Wald. She is the president of the Cape Cod chapter of Grandmothers Against Gun Violence. Welcome to the program, uh, Donna, and thank you so much for, for being with us to uh, tell you is more about uh, Grandmothers Against Gun Violence. It's a familiar name, but I'm sure that lots of people don't know exactly what you do. Well, um, we are a nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit grassroots organization that started in 2013 after the shootings at Sandy Hook Elementary, which we're all sadly familiar with. Our founder, um, Linda Alhart, um, founded the group way back then, and it was just a few grandmothers in a room, and it's been going strong ever since, which is amazing, because other groups have kind of fallen by the wayside, but uh, I really admire the fact that it has been going for as long as it has. Um, another thing to make clear, we are not against guns. We should get this out right at the beginning here. Yes, yes. Um, and we respect the Second Amendment, which is the right to bear arms, but we also realize that with the right to bear arms comes individual and societal responsibility. So that is where we are. And another main point I would like to make is that everybody always says, oh, gun violence is a political issue. Well, you know what? It's not a political issue. It's a public health issue now. We have over 38,000 people a year killed by gun violence. So we really like to say, don't tell me it's a political issue because among the gun owners, it's very evenly spread out between all political parties at this point. So it's not a political issue. It's yes, a public I, health issue. Yeah, I understand that, there, that the polls show that most Americans are very much for um, the kinds of protections that you support. So it is not political. No, it isn't. And over the last thing I saw was 95% of Americans support an expanded background check system, which is a system by which you are checked out before you own a gun. There is a bill in the Senate right now, it's called HR8, which was brought there by the House to increase the loopholes in the background check. And it's been sitting there and has not been heard, which yeah. I consider a travesty. Yes, yes. Uh, because those, um, those loopholes are what's allowing the wrong people to own guns. And we could stop it right at the, at the point of purchase if that loophole is closed. You totally could, and the, the more dangerous part of the loopholes is it puts a lot of firearms into the hands of criminals. So that's the problem. And then those guns are sold into an iron pipeline, which fuels the whole United States in illegal guns. So yeah, it's not good. Yes. So um, the. Um, uh, one of the one of the things. What, what tell us something about your activities? We know that um, that the chapters are uh, nationwide. You have uh, chapters all over the country, and then you often meet. And um, at these days, you're having Zoom meetings with other chapters. But uh, what what uh, sorts of activities are you um, involved with? Well, there is all all the other chapters you might see of Grandmothers Against Gun Violence are. Um, independently operating chapters. There's one in Kansas City and one in Seattle, and they're all just great. I mean, they're amazing. But, um, and we have conference calls with each other every now and then to catch up. We're on each other's mailing lists. So we're all, you know, connected on an idea platform. Um, we have, until the pandemic, we held monthly meetings nine months out of the year in, um, in the synagogue in Cape Cod. We rally at the Hyannis Rotary nine months out of the year. We attend um, meet, quarterly meetings of other gun violence prevention organizations um, in the city. We um, go to the state house if there's legislation that we need to talk about or support or whatever. We do, um, what else have we done? 
Um, we did a project called the Soul Box, which is where you create little tiny boxes for each life lost to gun violence. And that exhibit goes to Washington DC this spring. That was founded by a group in Oregon, I think. So yes, that's very interesting. And uh, viewers, if they want to follow that, uh, the Soul Box project, um, your website is so interesting and it shows pictures of that, very colorful pictures and it talks about that. So you have a, a very interesting website that viewers can, can check. We'll have put that on the screen for viewers to, to copy down. So, um, so then uh, what, what inspired you to become, um, become a member and to take a leadership position? Well, I was living in Minnesota when way back, if you remember when the um, Columbine shooting happened, it seems oh, like yeah. ages now, but it, and then they kept happening and they just kept happening. Then I moved here. And after I was here a few years, I happened to be driving by the Rotary and I saw these little grandmothers standing out there protesting gun violence. And I thought, you know, I'm retired. I think I'll look at this. So I went to one of their meetings and I was so impressed by the level of intelligence, research and commitment of these women that I said, I'm, I'm gonna stick with this. This looks really interesting. And then an opening came up because our, our past president wanted to retire. And I come out of um, a 30 year marketing, advertising and business um, background especially targeted marketing. And I thought, man, I could, I could be good for them. And I looked at the support structure and I thought, we ought to do this. And at that time, that was like two years ago, two and a half maybe. And before COVID, if you remember, the gun violence conversation was huge. We finally had the conversation. It was everywhere. It was on the news, it was on the Senate floor, it was everywhere. And I thought, what a great time to be a leader in a group like this. Yes. And so that's how it all began. Now, speaking about the, uh, the gun violence being in the news, it's very interesting that, uh, that uh, some of your literature points out that uh, a lot of the gun violence is not uh, necessarily mass shooting. So much goes on undetected and perhaps not well reported. Let's uh, tell, tell, let's tell us something about that. The kind well, of gun violence is very, very frequent. Right. I think I should. Um, I don't consider myself an expert on um, urban gun violence, but if you look at the papers and you look at Dorchester, Mattapan, up that way, Brockton up there. I have talked with women there who don't let their kids play in this outside after school because they're afraid they will be shot. Urban wow. violence in this country is huge. The mass shootings, and by a mass shooting, we define them as more than four people shot. The mass shootings we see, although they break our hearts, they are 1% of the gun violence in this country. So that should give you some kind of an idea how bad it really is, and especially in the urban areas. And I don't think people get that. I don't think they see that. I think they focus on the mass shootings and the tragedy and the sadness. But yeah. some of these people in the urban communities are living this on a daily basis. That is, that is, um, um... It's shocking and it and it's terrible and it, this should not be that um, that we have this in in our country. So um, this means then that the work you are doing, which is um, a good deal, it's it's educational, isn't it? I know that um, there is a a, a lot of uh, your activity not just in tracking legislation and but in uh, informing people giving them the facts about gun violence, that facts that are not well known. Yeah, our main emphasis before and still even during the pandemic was at our monthly meetings, we would have a 
um, a report on what's happening in the legislatures, whether it is this state or any other state. In fact, I used to do that before I was the president. And we'd also have speakers. So we'd have some politicians come, we'd have gun violence people come. Um, so yeah, one of our main goals has always been to educate because until you can get the conversation going, nothing's going to happen. Right, right. I would suspect that some of your activity is why there is such widespread support for, um, say, uh, background checks and common sense gun laws. We're lucky in Massachusetts that we have an A minus rating for gun safety, and that's very high. That's very good. Um, California has an A rating, and then the rest of the country. I mean, some of them also have really nice ratings, but there's a very huge part of the country that has terrible gun ratings or gun laws and um, whatever. But um, so part of our challenge is everybody goes, well, why do we care? Massachusetts is fine. Well, the point being that those laws did not come about by people not doing anything, number right. one. Number two, when you change your legislature, anything can happen to those laws. And number three, we were surrounded by states whose gun laws aren't as good as ours. So we suffer a lot from the overflow of them not being as good as we are. So it's just because you live in a state where everything is pretty good, it doesn't mean that you can ever let up. Exactly. And uh, I'm, 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 you're on the website, there's such interesting statistics. It seems that... Um, it seems that um, suicide, um, the suicide rate uh, by with by gun owners is very high. Um, uh, this is it still the case that um, the states that have the largest uh, number of gun owners, I also have the largest um, largest rate of suicide. Um, that's really interesting. There's a lot of good research done by um, um, the BU School of Public Health on suicide. And I would encourage people to go to that website and look at the recent series on suicide. They have done so much research on this. The suicide rate is high among older white men. It's also high in rural areas because there are so many guns in rural areas. And you know, our whole platform on that is the in suicide, the means matter, which is if your means is a firearm, you are 85% likely to die from a suicide attempt. Whereas if it's drugs or whatever else, the rate is not that high. Another okay. thing to make clear is that often um, um, people that attempt suicide with a gun do not go on to die of suicide if they survive. So what we like to say, and we say in my new campaign, which I'd like to talk about, is suicide with a gun is a permanent solution to a passing problem. And that's the sadness of it. Yes. yes. The idea being that, um, that uh, uh, the person contemplating suicide uh, at any moment with, particularly with some intervention can change and not want to die. So oh, yeah. it makes it just too immediate, too, too quickly before, before one can have second thoughts. Yes, that's so important for people to understand. Um, and, it is. Um, another great site I'm gonna throw out is the, um, um, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. It's um, AFSP.org. They have a great site and I would encourage anyone to go there and look at it because it's an amazing site and they do amazing work. And uh, what are some of the other uh, areas that um, of information that you are uh, making, working to make sure that people uh, have that and understand it? with respect to gun ownership. Okay, well, I'd like to show you something. This is my new, our new campaign, You Can oh. Save a Life Now. That's also available on our website, on our homepage. You just have to click, it's laying right under the top bar. And I'd like to get into that because 
aside from urban violence, <laughs> there are a lot of predictable, preventable gun tragedies. And I would also like now, especially to talk about COVID because what has happened during COVID with us all isolated, some people losing their jobs, a lot of frustration, a lot of depression. Those are all triggers for gun violence in the areas of domestic abuse and suicide. So we're in a particularly um, dangerous time. Plus we have a bunch of new gun owners, which I'm sure you have all read and let me find it here. Um, from January to June of this year during the pandemic, there were 2.5 million new gun owners. So we're talking new gun owners and because places are closed, this is gun owners with no training or anything. I mean, this is like fresh up new gun owners. And on top of that, before that, we had, um, we had 50 million Americans owning 300 million guns. So you need to understand the scope of the problem. So our new campaign, when we got going, COVID was not even around. We started writing this last November. And we thought, Look, just having, and statistics prove that having a gun in your house, you're five times more likely to have something bad happen. And that percentage is higher than your rate of protecting yourself from an intruder. So, yes, I see. That's so ironic because the <laughs> owner thinks that the gun is going to be there to protect, and yet it turns out that it doesn't. Yeah. So, let me start out with, uh, our first one is, our first category in our new brochure is um, safe gun storage, lock it up. There is a law in Massachusetts that you have to have your gun locked when you're not with it. In other words, when you're not using it, it has to be locked, your ammunition stored separately, locked also. And that is so things don't happen like your children getting a hold of it and shooting themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's also important to know that one of the major reasons for break-ins both in harm uh, cars and homes is searching for firearms. So if you leave, everybody's out of your house, you leave your firearm on the nightstand, somebody can break in, get it and use it in a crime. Yes. Another thing to know, and we'll get into this even further, is some of these mass shootings have happened because kids got access to unsecured firearms in their own homes. So leaving a firearm unsecured is irresponsible and it's dangerous. Now, if we move on to another preventable, predictable tragedy, domestic abuse. Uh, let me get down to domestic abuse. Um, uh, every month, 53 women are shot or killed by an intimate partner and 4.5 million report being threatened with a gun. So here we are again, it's a dangerous situation. People are home with each other more, tensions are high, very bad idea to have a firearm unlocked. And in some cases, even you know, in the home. In Massachusetts, we passed a new law a couple of years ago, right after the Parkland shootings called the ERPO, which is the Extreme Risk Protection Order, in which anyone, family member or police can go to the court and ask for a firearm to be removed from anyone they perceive to be a danger to themselves or others. And so often we hear about uh, someone who has uh, used um, a gun and shot someone who turns out to have uh, mental health problems. So that could have been prevented if uh, occasionally we read that uh, people in the community knew that this individual had mental health problems. So not uh, removing, making sure that, that people who are not, uh, not stable should not have guns just makes common sense. Oh, it totally does. And you could like, like, let's say for instance, you were in a neighborhood and you saw somebody using a firearm irresponsibly or a lot of target practicing or something you could not explain. You have every right to go to the police and 
strangely enough, in the state of California, 95% of the extreme risk protection orders being granted are police officers asking for them. Really? Wow. So it's a really helpful tool and we wish everyone knew about it um, and would look at it. So we have a whole section in our wire here on protection orders, how you do them, where you go get them, everything. In can, our last, can that uh, literature be um, printed out? Uh, yes, your... it can. If you go on our website, if we show that link at the end of this, you can go there and print it out. We're yes. also trying to get it out into the community. And I'm going to talk a little bit, um, since we've already talked about suicide prevention, which is our third um, thing in the brochure is that we have started to market this and marketing something like this in this situation of COVID is very difficult. You can't meet with people, you can't yes. meet with your own people, you can't. So we're moving along and it's going really well. We started out with the police departments on the Cape. We have three police departments which are signed on and have agreed to, um, to put this literature, this folder with their um, firearm permits. So that's great. I oh, mean, you great. get it yes. right great. at the beginning. I have two more appointments next week with two more police departments. Um, the libraries across the Cape have been great. As they've opened one by one, this literature is in most libraries now. We've got in a few placements in community health centers that are open. We're gonna, we sent it to almost half the churches on the Cape and we're hoping when they open, so my other plea is that if there are any organizations that listen to this and you want these brochures, whether you're open or not, you can always get ready for when you're gonna open, just email us. Our email will be at the end of this and we will see you get it. Excellent, that's wonderful. And, uh, and what, what else is on that uh, brochure? Well, the other one which you and I briefly talked about is uh, suicide. I see. And it's all about you know, each of these topics, the, um, the lock it up, the domestic abuse and the suicide, they all have an explanation of what the problem is. And on the flip side, resources, where to call, where to go, because really what we wanted this to be, we didn't want it to be so much a gun violence piece per se as a community resource piece. Yes, that makes so much sense. It's, uh, it's educating. Uh, letting us uh, know facts that uh, that really uh, people are not aware of, so it is raising raising awareness um, about this. I, I think that's um, the, that's a great effort, and uh, so you have connected with the I mean, you have the support of local police departments. We do, and it's it's um, there's so many ways to market this, and so many you know places to go. I wish, we, I wish we could get to people before they buy a gun, because I think if they looked at this brochure, they would think, wow, you know, I have a teenager in the house who's moody sometimes. I have toddlers in this house. I, you know, I have a relative that sometimes isn't yeah. quite right. And I just wish people would weigh the risk before... Yes they do something like this because it's a huge responsibility. And don't get me wrong, I come from a family that was a hunting family. I actually target shot when I was a teenager. So it's not like I, you know. I understand, yes. And I think people should understand that too. It is uh, the thought that um, thinking that the gun, it will protect you is uh, blinding some people to the risks that are involved with um, gun ownership and the tremendous responsibility that goes with it. Oh, exactly, exactly. That's, um, and you know, I can tell you from having target practice with a handgun, it takes a great deal of skill, yeah. especially yeah. in a situation. In fact, one thing I'd like to say is, I know somebody that trains SWAT officers, and he told me once, no matter how well trained, when you get in a really bad situation, at least 50% of your training goes right out the window right. because your adrenaline is so high. So what chance does an average person who took one shooting course at a range have of actually staying in control and right. 
really. Yes, yeah. This does speak of the um, the um, unintended consequence sometimes the that the shot turns out to have been not intended because, right. because it is so difficult to control. That perhaps accounts for so much of the violence that we see. Well, and it's, it's um, I'm waiting because we've really seen no statistics since the COVID on the gun violence, but I think it's very interesting because obviously there haven't been many mass shootings because nobody's out in a mass. But I'm really concerned when I see people carrying firearms to intimidate other people. Uh, I'm really concerned about where we're going from here. Yes, yeah. There appears to be a, a, a culture uh, that seems to be a, a culture of um, gun carrying uh, that um, I think for some people has a, a rather a shades of uh, manliness, uh, uh, that sort of thing that uh, perhaps is uh, blinding them to the, the real danger that's involved. That, that it is not a, a culture that it, it, it assumes that one has valor, but it turns out that uh, from what you're telling us, the very facts and the statistics that um, that that really is a is a huge mistake, and it really is more um, adding to more violence than it is to protection. Well, it's it's interesting because I think there was a lawsuit, and I well I know there was a lawsuit. I just can't state where it was that actually targeted one of the major gun manufacturers for marketing one of the AR weapons in. Um, a very hyper masculine way. And that AR weapon was one of the ones used in the mass shooting. And I don't remember how it ended or if it's now on another appellate level, but they actually went after them for actually marketing a lethal weapon in such a hyper masculine way. Yes. yes. And yeah. I know from marketing for years, I marketed to people for years that I think if you went way, way, way back and some graduate student ought to do this, they ought to do a thesis on how marketing changed the gun culture. Because interesting. I think it would be really interesting. <laughs> yes, yes. Because it is persuasive. It is persuasive. Oh, it is. It, um, it is. There's we no... Love it from, uh, but at the same point, I would like to say we have a ton of responsible gun owners out there. Yes. We have a ton of people who don't want to see their sport tarnished by everything that's going on alongside this. And I think the more we can draw those people in, I just saw that one of the big um, gun violence organizations, um, prevention organizations, the Brady Group, has founded a Gun Owners for Safety. Oh, very nice. Really cool. I saw about five different states. There's five different chapters now. And I'm going to try to get in touch with them because that's the way to go on a lot of this because you yeah. have to get the gun owners to talk to the gun owners. Yes. And uh, this issue to, to, first of all, depoliticize it. Conversation can begin when it is not seen as political. It can be seen just as a, as you said earlier, a public health problem that has nothing to do with one's uh, political uh, persuasion. Oh, exactly. There's no reason. There's no reason it should even be political. It's like smoking was, you know. It's yes. a public health issue that we have to figure out. Yes. How to make it better? And I really feel we have a lot of responsible gun owners out there. At least ninety-five percent who would be with us on some very rudimentary changes. Yes, yes. So what, what, um, what activities are you looking, uh, looking at uh, for the near future, um, with, um, even with COVID? Well, we're going to keep marketing this brochure until we get rid of all of it. <laughs> well, you know, that, um, that um, pre 
having producing that kind of uh, literature is uh, expensive. What do you do for funding? We do. We rely on dues. We have a um, hundred dues paying members. Um, we also have a lot of people that from time to time are really charitable and will donate, which we really appreciate because this year has been really rough and we funded to market this brochure, but we didn't fund well enough to market it in a time of COVID where everything's more expensive. You're mailing things, you're yes, yes. things, you're so, um, you know, we're always looking for donations, which anyone could do on our homepage. Great. Um, great. We manage our money really responsible. I often, <laughs> I'm looking way too responsible <laughs> with money. Right. So, um, so, yeah, we do dues and we do donations. We usually do, um, uh, we'll probably be giving on Tuesday. On Giving Tuesday, we're setting up on Facebook now to see if we can take advantage of Giving Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's tough. I mean, between the elections and everything, people are like tapped out. And um, yes. it's very hard to get attention now. Like when we have Zoom calls, they're nowhere near as big as I would like to see. And it is because we deal in a very depressing topic. So yes. everybody's depressed anyway. So then it may be depressing, but it's so critical. It's so critical because oh, this, 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 as you said, uh, women are dying across the country. Young people are suicides are this is critical it must it must be addressed well and, and the suicides of the young people are showing a trend up like they never have before and that really upsets us yes. um almost more than anything because for a while it was just older people which was bad enough but then when we see our youth with the covid and everything being um impacted it's heartbreaking it is it is and so the work you're doing with education is critical. And the more, the more um, information like this, the quicker people will come to understand the real dangers that are involved with, uh, or the, uh, the dangers and the, um, the need for responsible gun ownership. Um, oh, well, right. Yeah. No, well, um, go on. I've always thought that this country is a, Ooh, a country of conservative change. I think it really is. I think things change slowly. And I remember I heard a very well-loved politician speaking the other day, and he said, I always considered my job as a relay race. I never thought I could be the one to solve anything totally by myself, but I had to be the one to carry the baton, to pass it on to someone else. And that's kind of the way I feel. You're never going to solve a problem by yourself, but if you create awareness, you get going, somebody else is going to pick up on that. Um, so that's kind of the way I feel, although it gets depressing sometimes. Yes, um, yes. Gradualism isn't uh, exciting. People want change immediately, but gradualism, the gradual approach works. And I think as we look at uh, history and the changing changing cultures, it is always uh, gradual. We, it's so gradual, we don't even recognize the change sometimes. All of a sudden we just say, well, isn't this always the way it was? Wouldn't that be wonderful that, that we will, will, will one day be able to say, because there is no problem with guns, we'll be able to say, oh, wasn't it always this way? Right. And, we don't remember all, all the rest of that, which is- Yes, yes. Yes. Now, um, it seems to me very fitting that um, the grandmothers are involved in this because being a, a, the grandmother is uh, typically the, um, the so almost the vision that we have of the person who in society is the keeper of cultures and the one who helps young families flourish. Yet, um, Yet uh, there's a problem because we have some maybe grandfathers who are also very willing to 
to um, help out and to share in the work that you're doing. So um, it's not just grandmothers. And there are plenty of women who are not grandmothers that you probably have, uh, have uh, working with you. Um, we do, and our name Grandmothers Against Gun Violence is really limiting because it's grandmothers, but we have never ever, in fact, before the COVID, we were thinking of having an open house last year um, to actually address that we aren't just grandmothers. We'd like yeah. young women, we'd like grandfathers, we'd like men, we'd like yeah. young people especially, I would love to get involved. And we've made a few strides in that area, mm -hmm. but it should, the name should not be limiting. We, we um, you know, it takes a great deal of money and whatever to change a name. So yes. we've kind of stayed away from that for now, maybe not forever. But no, this we're we're all in this together. We're in all these things together. Yes, yes, we are. And yes. grandma, I'd like to say one thing about this group because this group is a bunch of really bright women, some of whom have had great careers, which are Mind blowing and very creative. I we have never come up across something that we said, oh, we're just going to give up on this. You know, it's it's there's always an idea, there's always something, and it's also a very um, a group of women that's very generous with their own um, resources. Very nice. And so, anyone who wants to join, and you certainly have made a great case for joining they can find the way to join on the website. Yes, you can. And if you feel like um, you want to join and you want to um, kind of pay dues, you just go on our donate. If you find maybe, well, I don't really know. Let's see what these people are about. Go to our Gmail account, leave us your email and request to be put on our mailing list because then you get a chance to see you know, what we do, and then you can go on the website, too, and just yeah, walk yeah. around uh, and, you know, see, because not everybody wants to join straight up, but um, so there's a number of ways, and we'll show you those at the end, I hope. That's, and I, I like that. Uh, it's a very personal touch, isn't it, that uh, for somebody who is interested, that they will uh, email you. And, uh, oh, sure and get some, a response from that. Well, I cannot thank you enough for, for tell, giving us this very important information. And oh. so I, 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 I wish you well in the work that you do. And I know that viewers join me in, in thanking you. We're very grateful for that work that you do. Well, I'd like to thank you all for having us because all these exposures are good. And I just want everybody to stay safe out there. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, viewers, for tuning in. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time on Conversations with Barbara.